The Jungle Book, Chapter 4, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter 4, Part 2. That autumn he left the beach as soon as he could, and set off alone because of a notion in his bullet head. He was going to find Sea Cow, if there was such a person in the sea, and he was going to find a quiet island with a good firm beach for seals to live on, where men could not get at them. So he explored and explored by himself from the north to the south Pacific, swimming as much as three hundred miles in a day and a night. He met with more adventures than can be told, and narrowly escaped being caught by the basking shark, and the spotted shark, and the hammerhead, and he met all the untrustworthy ruffians that loaf up and down the seas, and the heavy, polite fish, and the scarlet-spotted scallops that are moored in one place for hundreds of years, and grow very proud of it. But he never met Sea Cow, and he never found an island that he could fancy. If the beach was good and hard, with a slope behind it for seals to play on, there was always the smoke of a whaler on the horizon, boiling down blubber, and Kodak knew what that meant. Or else he could see that seals had once visited the island and had been killed off, and Kodak knew that where men had come once they would come again. He picked up with an old stumpy-tailed albatross, who told him that Kerguelen Island was the very place for peace and quiet, and when Kodak went down there he was all but smashed to pieces against some wicked black cliffs in a heavy sleet storm with lightning and thunder. Yet, as he pulled out against the gale, he could see even there had once been a seal nursery, and it was so in all the other islands that he visited. Limmershin gave a long list of them, for he said that Kodak spent five seasons exploring, with a four months' rest each year at Novastoshna, when the Holluschickie used to make fun of him in his imaginary islands. He went to the Galapagos, a hard, dry place on the equator, where he was nearly baked to death. He went to the Georgia Islands, the Orkneys, Emerald Island, Little Nightingale Island, Gough Island, Bouvet Island, the Crozets, and even to a little speck of an island south of the Cape of Good Hope. But everywhere the people of the sea told him the same things. Seals had come to those islands once upon a time, but men had killed them all off. Even when he swam thousands of miles out of the Pacific, and got to a place called Cape Corrientes, that was when he was coming back from Gough Island, he found a few hundred mangy seals on a rock, and they told him that men came there too. That nearly broke his heart, and he headed round the horn back to his own beaches, and on his way north he hauled out on an island full of green trees, where he found an old, old seal who was dying, and Kodak caught fish for him and told him all his failures. "'Now,' said Kodak, "'I am going back to Novastoshna, and if I am driven to the killing pens with the Hollis Chickie, I shall not care. The old seal said, Try once more. I am the last of the lost rookery of Mas Afuera, and in the days when men killed us by the hundred thousand, there was a story on the beaches that some day a white seal would come out of the north and lead the seal people to a quiet place. I am old, and I shall never live to see that day but others will. Try once more. And Kodak curled up his mustache, it was a beauty, and said, I am the only white seal that has ever been born on the beaches, and I am the only seal, black or white, who has ever thought of looking for new islands. This cheered him immensely, and when he came back to Novastoshna that summer, Matka, his mother, begged him to marry and settle down, for he was no longer a hollis chick, but a full-grown sea-catch, with a curly white mane on his shoulders, as heavy, as big, and as fierce as his father. "'Give me another season,' he said. "'Remember, mother, it is always the seventh wave that goes farthest up the beach.' Curiously enough, there was another seal who thought that she would put off marrying till the next year, and Kodak danced the fire-dance with her all down Lucannon Beach, the night before he set off on his last exploration. This time he went westwards, because he had fallen on the trail of a great shoal of halibut, and he needed at least one hundred pounds of fish a day to keep him in good condition. He chased them till he was tired, 
and then he curled himself up and went to sleep on the hollows of a ground-swell that sets into Copper Island. He knew the coast perfectly well, so about midnight, when he felt himself gently bumped on a weed-bed, he said, "'Hm, tide's running strong tonight,' and turning over under water, opened his eyes slowly and stretched. Then he jumped like a cat, for he saw huge things nosing about in the shoal-water and browsing on the heavy fringes of the weeds. "'By the great combers of Magellan,' he said, beneath his moustache, "'who in the deep sea are these people?' They were like no walrus, sea lion, seal, bear, whale, shark, fish, squid, or scallop that Kodak had ever seen before. They were between twenty and thirty feet long, and they had no hind flippers, but a shovel-like tail that looked as if it had been whittled out of wet leather. Their heads were the most foolish-looking things you ever saw, and they balanced on the ends of their tails in deep water when they weren't grazing bowing solemnly to each other and waving their front flippers as a fat man waves his arm. Ahem, <coughs> said Kodak. Good sport, gentlemen? The big things answered by bowing and waving their flippers like the frog footman. When they began feeding again, Kodak saw that their upper lip was split into two pieces that they could twitch apart about a foot and bring together again with a whole bushel of seaweed between the splits. They tucked the stuff into their mouths and chumped solemnly. "'Messy style of feeding, that,' said Kodak. They bowed again, and Kodak began to lose his temper. "'Very good,' he said. "'If you do happen to have an extra joint in your front flipper, you needn't show off so. I see you bow gracefully, but I should like to know your names.' The split lips moved and twitched, and the glassy green eyes stared, but they did not speak. "'Well,' said Kodak, "'You're the only people I've ever met uglier than Seavich, and with worse manners.' Then he remembered in a flash what the Burgomaster Gull had screamed to him when he was a little yearling at Walrus Islet, and he tumbled backwards in the water, for he knew that he had found sea-cow at last. The sea-cows went on slooping and grazing and chumping in the weed, and Kodak asked them questions in every language he had picked up in his travels, and the sea-people talk nearly as many languages as human beings— but the sea-cows did not answer, because sea-cow cannot talk. He has only six bones in his neck where he ought to have seven, and they say under the sea that that prevents him from speaking even to his companions. But, as you know, he has an extra joint in his foreflipper, and by waving it up and down and about, he makes what answers to a sort of clumsy telegraphic code. By daylight Kodak's mane was standing up on end, and his temper was gone where the dead crabs go. Then the sea-cows began to travel northwards, very slowly, stopping to hold absurd bowing councils from time to time, and Kodak followed them, saying to himself, "'People who are such idiots as these are would have been killed long ago if they hadn't found out some safe island. And what is good enough for the sea-cow is good enough for the sea-catch. All the same, I'd wish they'd hurry.' It was weary work for Kodak. The sea-cow's herd never went more than forty or fifty miles a day, and stopped to feed at night, and kept close to the shore all the time, while Kodak swam round them, and over them, and under them, but he could not hurry them up one mile. As they went farther north, they held a bowing council every few hours, and Kodak nearly bit off his moustache with impatience, till he saw that they were following up a warm current of water, and then he respected them more. One night, they sank through the shiny water, sank like stones, and for the first time since he had known them, began to swim quickly. Kodak followed, and the pace astonished him, for he never dreamed that Sea Cow was anything of a swimmer. They headed for a cliff by the shore, a cliff that ran down into deep water, and plunged into a dark hole at the foot of it, twenty fathoms under the sea. It was a long, long swim, and Kodak badly wanted fresh air before he was out of the dark tunnel they led him through. "'My wig,' he said when he rose, gasping and puffing into the open water at the farther end. "'It was a long dive, but it was worth it.' The sea-cows had separated, and were browsing lazily along the edges of the finest beaches that Kodak had ever seen. There were long stretches of smooth-worn rock running for miles, exactly fitted to make seal-nurseries and there were playgrounds of hard sand sloping inland behind them, 
and there were rollers for seals to dance in, and long grass to roll in, and sand dunes to climb up and down, and best of all, Kodak knew by the feel of the water, which never deceives a sea-catch, that no men had ever come there. The first thing he did was to assure himself that the fishing was good, and then he swam along the beaches and counted up the delightful low sandy islands half-hidden in the beautiful rolling fog. Away to the northward, out to sea, ran a line of bars and shoals and rocks that would never let a ship come within six miles of the beach, and between the islands and the mainland was a stretch of deep water that ran up to the perpendicular cliffs, and somewhere below the cliffs was the mouth of the tunnel. "'It's Novastoshna over again, but ten times better,' said Kodak. "'Sea cow must be wiser than I thought. "'Men can't come down the cliffs, even if there were any men, "'and the shoals to seaward would knock a ship to splinters. "'If any place in the sea is safe, this is it.' "'He began to think of the seal he had left behind him. "'But though he was in a hurry to go back to Novastoshna, "'he thoroughly explored the new country, "'so that he would be able to answer all questions.' Then he dived and made sure of the mouth of the tunnel, and raced through to the southward. No one but a sea-cow or a seal would have dreamed of there being such a place, and when he looked back at the cliffs, even Kodak could hardly believe that he had been there. He was ten days going home, though he was not swimming slowly, and when he hauled out just above Sea Lion's neck, the first person he met was the seal who had been waiting for him, and she saw by the look in his eyes that he had found his island at last. But the Hollis Chickie and Sea Catch, his father, and all the other seals, laughed at him when he told them what he had discovered. And a young seal about his own age said, "'This is all very well, Kodak, but you can't come from no one knows where and order us off like this. Remember, we've been fighting for our nurseries, and that's a thing you never did. You preferred prowling about in the sea.' The other seals laughed at this, and the young seal began twisting his head from side to side. He had just married that year— and was making a great fuss about it. "'I've no nursery to fight for,' said Kodak. "'I only want to show you all a place where you will be safe. What's the use of fighting?' "'Oh, if you're trying to back out, of course, I've no more to say,' said the young seal, with an ugly chuckle. "'Will you come with me if I win?' said Kodak, and a green light came into his eye, for he was very angry at having to fight at all. "'Very good,' said the young seal, carelessly, "'If you win, I'll come.' He had no time to change his mind, for Kodak's head was out and his teeth sank in the blubber of the young seal's neck. Then he threw himself back on his haunches and hauled his enemy down the beach, shook him and knocked him over. Then Kodak roared to the seals, "'I've done my best for you these five seasons past. I've found you the island where you'll be safe, but unless your heads are dragged off your silly necks you won't believe. I'm going to teach you now. Look out for yourselves.' Limmershin told me that never in his life, and Limmershin sees ten thousand big seals fighting every year, never in his life did he see anything like Kodak's charge into the nurseries. He flung himself at the biggest sea-catch he could find, caught him by the throat, choked him, and bumped him and banged him till he grunted for mercy, and then threw him aside and attacked the next. You see, Kodak had never fasted for four months as the big seals did every year, and his deep-sea swimming trips kept him in perfect condition— and best of all, he had never fought before. His curly white mane stood up with rage, and his eyes flamed, and his big dog teeth glistened, and he was splendid to look at. Old Sea Catch, his father, saw him tearing past, hauling the grizzled old seals about as though they had been halibut, and upsetting the young bachelors in all directions, and Sea Catch gave a roar and shouted, "'He may be a fool, but he is the best fighter on the beaches. Don't tackle your father, my son, he's with you.' Kodak roared in answer, and old Sea Catch waddled in with his mustache on end, blowing like a locomotive, while Matka and the seal that was going to marry Kodak cowered down and admired their menfolk. It was a gorgeous fight, for the two fought as long as there was a seal that dared lift up his head, and when there were none, they paraded grandly up and down the beach side by side, bellowing. At night, just as the northern lights were winking and flashing through the fog, Kodak climbed a bare rock and looked down on the scattered nurseries and the torn and bleeding seals. "'Now,' he said, "'I've taught you your lesson.' "'My wig,' said old Sea Catch, boosting himself up stiffly, for he was fearfully mauled. "'The killer whale himself could not have cut them up worse. 
"'Son, I'm proud of you, and what's more, I'll come with you to your island, if there is such a place. "'Here, you fat pigs of the sea, who comes with me to Sea Cow's Tunnel? "'Answer, or I shall teach you again,' roared Kodik. "'There was a murmur, like the ripple of the tide all up and down the beaches. "'We will come,' said thousands of tired voices. "'We will follow Kodik the White Seal.' Then Kodik dropped his head between his shoulders, and shut his eyes proudly. He was not a white seal any more, but red from head to tail. All the same, he would have scorned to look at or touch one of his wounds. A week later, he and his army, nearly ten thousand Holluschickian old seals, went away north to Sea Cow's Tunnel, Kodik leading them, and the seals that stayed at Novostoshna called them idiots. But the next spring, when they all met off the fishing banks of the Pacific, Kodik seals told such tales of the new beaches beyond Sea Cow's Tunnel that more and more seals left Novostoshna. Of course, it was not all done at once, for the seals are not very clever, and they need a long time to turn things over in their minds. But year after year, more seals went away from Novostoshna, and Lucanon, and the other nurseries, to the quiet, sheltered beaches where Kodik sits all the summer through, getting bigger and fatter and stronger each year, while the hollis chickie play round him, in that sea where no man comes. Lucanon. This is a sort of sad seal national anthem. I met my mates in the morning, and oh, but I am old, where roaring on the ledges and summer groundswell rolled. I heard them lift the chorus that drowned the breaker's song, the beaches of Lucanon, two million voices strong. The song of pleasant stations beside the salt lagoons, the song of blowing squadrons that shuffled down the dunes, the song of midnight dances that churned the swell to flame, the beaches of Lucanon before the sealers came. I met my mates in the morning, I'll never meet them more. They came and went in legions that darkened all the shore. And o'er the foam-flecked offing, as far as voice could reach, we hailed the landing parties and we sang them up the beach. The beaches of Lucanon, the winter wheat so tall, the dripping crinkled lichens and the sea fog drenching all, the platforms of our playground all shining smooth and worn, the beaches of Lucanon, the home where we were born. I met my mates in the morning, a broken, scattered band. Men shoot us in the water and club us on the land. Men drive us to the salt house like silly sheep and tame, and still we sing Lucanon before the sealers came. Wheel down, wheel down to southward, O Guvaruska, go, and tell the deep-sea viceroys the story of our woe. Ere empty as the shark's egg the tempest flings ashore, the beaches of Lucanon shall know their sons no more. End of chapter 4